know when you're ready. Ah, okay, good. And here we are at 1110. So uh, welcome to the 20 October 2020 risk uh, seminar, UC Berkeley, the CEDAR seminar. Today, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Atman Munshid from uh, UC Berkeley CEDAR, uh, sorry, from uh, Cal Polytechnique. Exactly. Uh, Atman is just beginning a postdoc at UC Berkeley, but I don't know in which department, Atman. So Iowa, I, yeah, I, 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 yes. Uh -huh. I E O R in the I E O R. Okay. So in our engineering department. So welcome to Berkeley. We're delighted to have you Thank visiting you so with us this year. And the title: Improving Reinforcement Learning Algorithms Toward Policy Learning Rate Toward Optimal Learning Rate Policies. Sorry for the garbled introduction. And I turn it over. No, to No, that's you. fine. That's fine. So. So thank you for the invitation. So first, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce a work that I've done during my PhD thesis and where we try to find the optimal rate policy for some reinforcement learning algorithms. So this is joint work with one of my PhD advisors here, Charles Albert. And uh, so the outline of the presentation goes as follows. So it is divided in three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to bring some motivation and insights. And in the second part, I'm try to introduce our optimal learning rate policy. And uh, finally, in the third part, we present our adaptive method for the choice of the learning rate. So, so I'm going to start by introducing the problem. So first, reinforcement learning algorithm are useful in an exploration exploitation context where agents need to know how to act optimally in an unknown environment. And for this, they interact with the environment in order to discover it. So they interact with it in order to discover it. So in this presentation, we aim at showing that the classical one of a square root n convergence rate is pessimistic. So I'm not going to detail this part but uh, I'll focus both, I'll focus mainly in the two uh, other bullet points. So the second bullet point is to propose a methodology that improves the convergence of some reinforcement learning algorithm by a good choice of the learning rate. And the third point is to highlight the added value of our methodology in two problems. So the first problem is the optimal placement of limit orders. And the second one is the optimal execution of large number of shares. So these two problems are going to be detailed further. So I'll start with the problem. So what we want to do here, we want to estimate the vector Q. Here Q belongs to R to the power of D. And Q is solution of, is zero of the following vectorial equation. So this is a vectorial equation. Capital M here is a vector and uh, its co coordinate or its component of this vector M, which is Z, can be written in the following form. So it is the expected value of some small cost, but small n, of some cost here, small n. And m, our cost, depend on the function q that we want to estimate. And on another random variable, so x here is a random variable. We don't know its distribution because the environment is unknown. And we take the expectation here with respect to this random variable. And the Z is the coordinate, so this is the coordinate. So first we want to show that we can find such kind of equation in many contexts. So first example, I'm going to start with the following example. So we want to estimate uh, the mean of random variable S. So we want to estimate mu, the mean of random variable S, and we don't know the distribution of S. So by definition of the mean, we can always write the following equation. So we just say that the expected value of the mean is mu. And we can like notice that this equation and this one are the same. We just have to replace small q by mu and uh, replace uh, the random variable uh, x here by the random variable s. We can take the following expression for the cost small m and we get the same expression. So now this is the first example. Now I'm going to move to the second example. So this one is der derived from RL problems. So we consider 
So we have a final time horizon here, we call it capital T. And at each time we have an agent, at each time step we have an agent and the agent observes the current state S. He takes an action A according to its policy path and he gets a reward, so reward R, R and he finds himself in a new stage U. Again, when once he is in this new stage, he takes a new action, get a new reward and find himself in another new state, UT plus two, for example. And it loops over and over until the, the end of the game, until the end of the game. So now we are going to describe the goal of the agent. So the agent at, aims at maximizing on average the following quantity. So the gain of the agent can be written as the discounted sum of the future rewards. So R here are the future rewards and gamma here is just a discounting factor. So to solve one standard approach to solve such kind of problem is to estimate the Q function. So what is the meaning of the Q function? It is just the maximum expected gain of the agent when he starts at state in a initial state U and takes the first action A. And then after that, he acts optimally. So why it is interesting to uh, estimate Q? Because if we know Q, we know the optimal control. So to find the optimal action, if we know Q, we just have to take the action that maximize. So here the state is known. We know, we, I know that I'm in the current state. So U here is fixed. To get the maximal, the, the best action, I just have to take the one that maximize this function. So if I know the function, if I know the function, I can take the one that maximizes. So now we know how, why we want to estimate Q, but how can we do it? So one standard idea is to use the classical dynamic programming principle. So this is the equation that is the, this is the equation of the dynamic programming principle. So what is the inter interpretation behind it? So mainly the main idea is that the maximum expected gain that I may get when I start from state U and take the first action A is the re reward that I get right after plus what I can expect. So this is the reward that I can get right after plus a term that says what I can expect if I act optimally afterward. So now if we move this part to the left side, we can see that Q star, the Q function satisfies an equation similar to this. So we just have to replace small Q by Q star. We just, for the random variable X, we take the vector RT plus one, the next reward and the next state UT plus one. So X is the vector RT plus one, UT plus one. And Z now is a vector that contains the current state U and the current action A. So the coordinate now correspond to, to a couple state action. So this, perhaps we can remember this because it will be useful for the, the understanding of the rest of the presentation. Okay, so, okay, last, finally, last example. So if you want to consider, let's, let's consider a last example where we can find such type of equation. So consider the following minimization problem. We want to find Q. Q minimize T, the curve T can be written in the following form. We assume some smoothness conditions and convexity on G, and we can say that the minimizer is solution of the following is zero of the following equation. And here again, if we take Q like Q star, at the X for the random variable X and uh, the current sum for small m, it is the same equation. Okay. So we've seen that such type of equation can appear in many contexts. Now let's see how we can solve it. So the first idea is if we know if we know this the, the capital the function capital N, one idea to do to solve this one approach is to use the Newton algorithm. So what is the idea behind the Newton algorithm? The Newton algorithm starts with an initial guess Q0, and then at each step. It updates, the, it updates the approximation by m times the gradient of the inverse of m. So what is the problem of such approach? The problem, mainly the problem is that we need to compute the gradient and its inverse, and this may be expensive. So to avoid this, gradient descent algorithm replace the computation of the gradient and its inverse by sequence of non-negative 
real numbers that should meet some conditions. And when these conditions are met, we can show the convergence. What is the problem of such approach? Mainly the problem is that we need to know the capital M. And to know the capital M here, we need to uh, compute the expected value by definition of the capital. And to compute the expected value, we need to know the distribution of X. But the distribution of X is not known because the, in reinforcement learning framework, the environment is not known. So it is not easy to compute, or it is not at least straightforward to compute the expected value. That's why open Monroe algorithms replace uh, capital M by what is inside the expectation by small m. So instead of like updating by capital M, we can update by small m. And again, under some uh, conditions, we can show that such type of algorithm may converge. Um, excuse me, I, yes. I just want to clarify uh, something. Yes. So uh, sorry, I came in like two minutes late, so I missed the beginning of the talk. But your M equation, the, the main motivating equation, right? Yes. That's not more or less just a method of moments, right? Uh, yes, oh, yes, we have it very fast. Method of moments. Like, like from statistics, this is a very well studied yes. problem. Yes. So, so are, are you just motivating that your, you are, your contribution today is extending the method moments in, in an interesting way or, or, or I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, maybe yes. maybe I, so, I just the case I came late and I missed an initial. So yes, reading. what is what? So we'll see. So mainly the contribution will be about the choice of the learning rate. So how? So the choice of the learning rate and perhaps extending such result. Well, we will not see this in this presentation. So we extended some results to a framework, but mainly the contribution. I think for me the slide here is to show that with the. So uh, the, the goal here is to show that with a, a good choice of the learning rate, we can expect better convergence results of such type of algorithm. And uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm confused that um, so, you, yes. you showed three examples of this M equation, right? Yes. yes. And, uh, and I, I've seen, I understand, for example, for example, the example is just a standing mean. The second example is, if I remember, um, a, yeah, reinforcement learning. Model. Yes. Yeah. But. And, Yes, you just said that this equation itself, the M equation that you're selling, it, it just seems nothing more to me than just a method of moments. I guess, I guess that's why I'm. I'm... So I think. So, I think. So. Uh... So so for example, like in in, in statistics, yes. I, 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 from more statistics, econometrics, uh, yes. motivation. This M here could be just, be, in, in fact, um, not be a scalar function, but uh, in fact, you, you allow that to be, right? You can allow yes. it to be a vector of some interesting things, say. Yes. And and then you basically do either least squares or something like that based on that uh, set of equations and you derive various estimators. And in fact, say the GMM. Yes, it is, uh, less but, not, it is all, all that, right? but it is specific case. But in this, yes, in this problem, it is, so yes, starting from a minimization. So for example, the minimization problem associated to this equation is not so clear. So, right. if, so if you have a minimization problem, we can like uh, found such kind of problem. But if you had so this minimization problem to come back to the, in, so if you have this equation and come back to the minim, initial minimization problem, we have to add some, it's not that clear how you can come back without adding some other conditions. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. What, one more clarifying question before. Yes. Uh, um, can you go back to the previous slide on the dynamic programming yes. problem? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, dynamic programming. Yeah. Yes. So this example and so the m equation on the top and the yes. the m equation on the bottom. Yes. Um. I I don't quite understand how how the m equation from the top implies the second equation on the bottom because your dynamic program problem. Yes. Requires the agent to solve a condition expectation at time t at every point. Yes, but uh, take, so take here, x as conditional variable. Take x as a conditional variable. Right, but and, and if you take that, x, so the yes, uh, sorry, it, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So I can understand how how by the the tower property of conditional expectation operators that this. No, no, but uh, uh, don't need even uh, uh, yes, okay. But uh, I think do, don't, do not, uh, in a Markov framework, we don't need even the 
the tower property. We don't need to, to apply another uh, expectation. Just take X as uh, the random. So we can de define the conditional law of random variable. So we can take a conditional law of random variable. So if uh, we, we do conditioning and you have a conditional distribution. So here we take the expectation with respect to the conditional distribution. And we have many, that's, that's the idea. Um, okay. uh, perhaps we can talk offline. Yes, yes, perhaps. Sure. Thank you. And yes. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, and yes, sorry, so I was here. So yes, fine. So yes, Robbins Monroe algorithms just replace the capital M by the small m, and we have con uh, convergence conditions and and there some and some some so we have convergence under some conditions. And what happens in reinforcement learning in general is that we don't have access to the whole vector M, but only one coordinate. Because if you remember in example uh, two, so the state here Z is associated, the co coordinate here Z is associated to a state U. And uh, the agent in reinforcement learning, the agent visit at each step visit one state. So if he visits one state, he visits one coordinate. So since we know one coordinate, we have access to only one coordinate of this vector. And in such context, reinforcement learning algorithm replace the update of the whole vector here by only the update of one coordinate. So instead of updating the whole vector small m, we only update one coordinate. And again, under suitable conditions, we can, we can show the convergence. So brief overview of uh, the literature. So I'm going to start with Robbins Monroe algorithm mainly. So the Robbins Monroe algorithm we all was introduced in 51. And uh, uh, many we can find in the literature convergence results and central limit theorems for such type of algorithm. After that, in, in the late 50s, uh, the dynamic programming principle was introduced by Benman. And uh, some few, so, so few years later, reinforcement uh, learning literature started. Mainly the idea was to combine, to apply the Robbins Monroe algorithm to the, to the dynamic programming principle. And so by combining this, we had the, the first, uh, the reinforcement by two of these reinforcement learning started. And then it becomes famous with the, the paper of Sutton. And nowadays, reinforcement learning covers a wide collection of receipts and methods. So I'm going to present, uh, I am going to end this part with the, first, with the convergence result. So when the learning rate verifies the following conditions, so here it is standard, it, does a, it, it, it simply means that the sum of the, uh, that the sum of the learning rate should explode and the sum of the squares should stay bounded. Here we add uh, convexity conditions. So this works like a convexity condition. So Q star is the zero, is the, the solution that we want to reach. So it's the, it's the vector that uh, cancels M. So M of Q star is equal to zero. That's what is, the, is our solution. And we add some boundedness. So this is, is like, if you ha don't have the constant, if you don't have the one, it's like Lipschitz condition. And so this is like a Lipschitz condition. It's less restrictive than Lipschitz condition. And under this condition, we can show that uh, our estimation converge to the solution. And such type of results can be found in this, for, in, in this reference. So now I'm going to move to the optimal learning rate policy. So, uh, so first, so the goal of the first slide is to show that the learning rate plays an important role in the convergence. So for this, we just consider the the, in the example one, the uh, the the example one esti estimation of the mean, and for this problem estimation of the mean, we consider a standard robbins monroe algorithm, and we use different choices, two choices of the learning rate. So in blue, we have Robbins Monroe algorithm with learning rate proportional to one over N. 
And in orange, the learning rate is different, is piecewise constant. And for each choice of the learning rate, we plot the error as a function of the number of iterations. And we can see that the behavior of the error varies a lot depending on the choice of the learning rate. So, for the, 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 so the, the, the behavior of the error varies a lot. It varies a lot. And uh, so conclusion of the first slide, the, the, it, the, 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 the learning rate, the choice of the learning rate plays an important role. OK, next slide. So this is from practical point of view. Generally, if the learning rate is too high, so the loss, the error may explode. When we start decreasing uh, the learning rate, so it is still high, but not that much, the error decreases faster at the beginning, but at the end, we reach like a non-zero value. So the stationary value here is non-zero. If we keep decreasing the learning rate, so we decreases, so the decrease is, uh, we still decrease, but uh, le less faster. Uh, yes, the decrease is, uh, is not as fast as previously, but we reach a smaller, a smaller final value. And finally, if the learning rate is too, too low, we decrease very, very slowly to a small final value. So this is from practical point of view. From theoretical point of view or theoretical perspective, we can find some general conditions under which we have the convergence. The problem of these conditions is that in some cases, the set S may be very large. Uh, so it does not, so these conditions do not tell us how to choose the learning rate in practice. And uh, in some cases, the set of possible values may be also empty. Why? Because uh, these conditions, in fact, hide some recurrence properties. So that's why authors in uh, the literature propose the following choices for, of the learning rate. So they choose it proportional to one over n to the power alpha. In some cases, they choose it constant. We can find some algorithm like, like the Adagrad algorithm that scales the learning rate with respect to the sum of the square past values mm -hmm. of the gradient. And we have also some algorithm. It is like Adagrad, but he replaced the sum of the square values of the past gradient, but by weighted sum or exponential weighted sum average. So our approach here is going to be a little bit different because it is based on the sign of consecutive gradients. So it's not based on the values, but on the sign, in, in the sign of uh, consecutive gradients. So I'm going to introduce the algorithm. So we have two levels. So we call the first, these levels are interacting. interacting. So in the first, the first level, we call it the upper level and the second level, we call it the inner level. So in the first level, we use a reference learning rate. So this reference learning rate is mainly used to insert, to guarantee the convergence. And what, what, what we are going to use in practice is the following current learning rate. So the current learning rate is learning rate that is going to fluctuate around the reference one. So sometimes we are going to increase this, this current learning rate. So we increase it with a function h, and sometimes we decrease it, and we decrease it with a function l. And we, 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 are, we are going to decrease it when two descents are in the same direction, and other, we are going to increase it when two errors are in the same direction. Otherwise, we decrease it. And we will detail after how to a possible choice for the function h and f. So in the literature, this looks like the line search strategy. So the line search strategy, what does it say? It says that we have to increase the learning rate, the learning rate as long as the error, as there is improvement. So here there is improvement means simply that two errors or two descents are in the same direction. We can also find the paper here that have an approach really close to ours. So, but it is in a different context. So it is in the graph drawing or graph visualization. So in their paper, they do not call gamma n here the learning rate, they call it the temperature. And uh, in some cases they increase it, in others they decrease it. And they increase it or decrease it depending on the direction of two consecutive errors. 
So what is what, what they mean by the direction? So each the errors are vectors. They look at the, the, the cosinus of the angles between two vectors. And if the cosinus of the angle so, is close to one, they increase it. Otherwise, they decrease. They may decrease. So this, uh, these are the two inspiration, they say. And in practice, and uh, yes, and they show also that uh, they can get better results with, the, with their strategy. So such strategy allow, it allows them to get better results. So in practice, it is like the standard. So like the standard uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, we just add the following conditioning. So we just add the following conditioning. And, uh, and uh, the idea is to say, if two errors are in the same direction, we are going to increase. So here, what we change is simply the learning rate. We are going to increase it with a function h. Otherwise, we are going to lower it or decrease it with a function a. So what, what it remains, it only remains to say how one can choose the function h or function m. So one possible choice is to multiply the learning rate by two, for instance, when the errors are in the same direction. And to get a good behavior, we just add upper bound and lower bound. So we just add upper bound here and we add lower bound here. And uh, for the lower bound, one can take simply the reference learning rate. And for the upper bound, he can, he can take just the reference learning rate times a constant. And for the lowering function, we, when we, just, we can just come back to the reference learning rate when the error starts to fluctuate or to oscillate. For the, so this is possible choices. So I try to illustrate in uh, with this graph how 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 the acceleration works how the inner level works so the idea what we are going to do here we want to find the zero so it is a simple example so we are in dimension one we have a function f a blue function f here we want to find the zero of this blue function f and uh, to do that we are just going to compare the newton the algorithm standard newton algorithm with our acceleration so what does the standard Newton algorithm? It starts with the guess, initial guess x0 here. And it takes the tangent. It sees the crossing with the, the x-axis. And this, the, the crossings gives us the next iteration, the new approximation. So for our, for our acceleration, the first iteration is the same since we don't have past errors. So the first iteration, the one of the Newton algorithm and ours is exactly the same. So we move now to the second iteration. So the Newton algorithm does the same thing, takes the tangent, see the crossing with the x-axis and we have new approximation. So now for our acceleration, there's gonna be a difference. Why? Because two errors, so here the value of the error is positive and here is positive, two, two errors are in the same direction. So we are going to take learning rate a little bit higher than the one of the standard Newton algorithm. And taking learning rate a little bit higher comes to a choosing a line, the green line here, instead of the tangent. So bigger tangent, instead of the tangent, which would be. And so we, uh, we, we reach a point here, an approximation here, P2, that is a little bit better than the one given by the Newton algorithm because the error here, so that's the point that we want to reach. That's our approximation. This is close to the point that we want to reach. So what is the idea behind such, what uh, our acceleration tries to do? The main idea is that it tries to take this line here, but this is not possible. So, it, so what it checks, so it checks whether we are below or above this line. Why? Because if we are below this line, it means that so two errors are in uh, in the same direction, or uh, two yes, two errors are in the same direction. So when the function because if if we are be below this line, the function f, as you can see, it is always positive. So two errors in the same direction. And if you get above this line, the function f here becomes negative. So negative, positive, two errors are, posi in, are not in the same direction. So if two arrows are in the same direction, we are below this line here. So we need to take 
a bigger learning rate to get closer. And if two errors are not in the same direction, we get beyond this line, we went beyond this line. So we, we need to decrease a little bit the learning rate. So this is the idea of, and we can see that Newton algorithm does not reach the, the zero after the third iteration, while the acceleration after the third iteration, it reaches the zero. Okay, so now I finished with the final level. Now I'm going to move to the upper level. So first, we, so I try to propose two approaches. So the first approach is empirical. I'll try to detail it. And the second one is more like uh, theoretical. And in the second one, we try to get like simple formulas. So in the first, so we've already seen this picture. It just describes the behavior of the error for different choices of constant learning rates. So when it is uh, high, the error explodes. When it is high, but not that much, it decreases faster at the beginning, but reach a non-zero value. When we keep decreasing, it reach smaller values, but at slower rate. And finally, if it is too slow, it reach a final value that is small, but very slowly. So now, can we, the question is, can we find an adaptive choice of the learning rate that behaves, that uh, outperforms these three, these four constant ones? So the idea here, one first idea would be to just consider the start with the, the black one, the black learning rate, because it has the best behavior. And when it is no more the best one, we switch to the new best one and repeat the same procedure. So more generally, so more generally, one can start with the highest uh, learning rate possible and uh, uh, keep track of the of the, the error value. And once the error starts stabilizing, we can change the uh, learning rate, the reference learning rate, and uh, choose a smaller learning rate. So this kind of uh, uh, so this kind of procedure is it looks like the early stopping algorithms widely used in machine learning. So it keeps track of the error, and when the error behaves not well, it uh, it changes. Uh, it, it keep uh, it, we can discuss it later, but it looks like the the early stopping algorithm. And now we are going to part. So it is the the same question, but we want to find a simple expression for the reference learning rate. So uh, for this, we are going to introduce the following notations. So Q star is simply the solution, the a solution of this equation. So we assume that it exists. Uh, EK is an error vector. So it is the square difference between our estimation and the solution. And generally, in gradient-like algorithms, what we the the proof of convergence is based on the following inequality. So here we can forget this term, this term, because this term is uh, looks like so this term is a particular case that is linked to reinforcement learning. So what does it say? It only says that when we do not reach a component the error does not change. So EK here and EK plus one here have the same value. So we can focus, so we can forget about this term and focus about this term. And these terms tell us when we, when we reach a component, the error decreases with a factor alpha K here, but it also increases with the constant M here. And uh, uh, so this constant M here it gathers some imprecision or uh, error, some imprecision errors. And uh, for instance, it is the variance here. So in the error, in the end here, we can find the variance term. So, so what our starting point will be this inequality and we will try to rewrite it in the following way. So we just remove the inequality and replace it by, by one equality. So, and here we add, but to do this, we add an error term. So this is an error term that we add here. And we assume that on average, it is negative to be consistent with the previous inequality. 
And what we are going to assume, we are going to add an, an additional assumption that this term here does not depend on the learning rate. So only alpha and the constant m depends on the learning rate. And uh, finally, we are, I'm just going to define what the agent aims at finding. So he wants learning rate gamma that minimize on average the error. And under suitable conditions, mainly boundedness conditions, we can show that the learning rate here has the following form. So mainly we have a constant here, which is L over B. This is a standard constant. Standard learning rate, learning rate have the following uh, expression. And we add fluctuation term or oscillation, fluctuation term around this value that is going to depend on the past values of the error. Okay, so I think that I finished with the second part. And now I'll try to move to some numerical examples. So uh, we are going to study two examples here that are uh, related to finance. Why? Because my PhD was finance oriented. So the first one is optimal placement problem of limit orders. And the second one is optimal execution. So I'm going to start with the first one, optimal placement. So we have an agent. The agent wants to buy a unit quantity. And for this, he has two type of actions. So we can send limit orders or market orders. And the goal of the agent is to find the right balance between past execution and avoiding trading cost. So why fast execution? Because market orders enables the agent to get immediate execution. So it is fast execution. However, when you use market orders, you have to pay an additional cost, which is the bid ask spread. And so it's not always uh, the best action. So I tried to draw the following graph in order to illustrate the problem. So here, this Q here, it, uh, it represents the best buyers. So here is the, represent the best buyers. This quantity here represents the best sellers or the best uh, quantity that one can, yes, the best sellers. And the X axis here is the price value. So uh, what uh, we can see, we can see first that the price of the best sellers is higher than the price of the best buyers. Uh, this is expected because if there was a crossing, and transaction can be made. And so there is a matching and a transaction can be made. We also can see that all the best buyers have the same buying price because if some buyers have, uh, if buyers have not the, the, the same buying price, some buyers will have price perhaps more profitable than others. And these ones with the most profitable buying price will be the new best buyers. So this is the, so all the buyers have the same price, all the sellers have the same price. And since I'm agent, the agent, since uh, the agent wants to buy, he has a quantity inserted between the buyers. And what is the problem of the agents? He just want to know, uh, is it, he wonder whether it is more profitable to stay in the queue and buy at cheaper price here or send the market orders, get immediate execution, but buy at a higher price. So if he stays in the queue, the good point is that he can buy at cheaper price, but he needs to wait. So the drawback is that he needs to wait and waiting has a cost, so there is a waiting cost. So if he waits a few seconds, it is fine, but if he waits like during a long period, it is no more interesting. And for, the, for sending market orders, so he can get immediate execution, so he does not wait, but he needs to pay an additional price. So this spread here is an additional price. So the agent needs to find a trade-off or a balance. Okay, so what's the quantity that the agent wants to minimize? So these are details. We are going just to focus on this equation. So at the end of the game, so this time is the end of the game. At the end of the game, the agent is going to buy at the best buying price, P, or if he sends market orders, he's going to add this cost, this spread cost here. And during the game, he has a waiting cost. 
and we consider constant waiting cost. So as seen in example two, the Q function of this problem satisfy the dynamic programming principle. And uh, the Q function of this problem satisfy dynamic programming principle. And uh, as we also already seen in example two, the dynamic programming principle can be written in the following form. So it can be written in the following form, expected value of something. And this is the kind of equations that we studied. So we can apply our algorithms and we have the first results. So what we plot here, we compare here two algorithms and uh, the approximation given by two algorithms after 300 iterations. So the graph on the left here is the theoretical value is the theoretical uh, the value given by uh, the theoretical value it is given by numerical scheme where we assume that we know the parameters of the model or we know the environment the two so the two graphs here so this one is given by a standard reinforcement learning algorithm where the learning rate is piecewise constant and this one is given by the same reinforcement learning algorithm where we add our acceleration depending on the whether the the errors are in the same direction or not and we can see that this graph is closer to the theoretical one than this one so i just forgot to yes to describe the graph here so what we can see here is the best buyer quantity so it is the size of the queue the best buyer quantity of size and what you can see in the y axis here is my position on the queue so as expected, my position of, on the queue is always lower than the size, the total size of the queue. That's why we don't have anything here. And the one and zeros here are the best decision. So when the queue has this value and when I'm in position three, the best decision is one means that I should stay in the queue. And when the best decision is zero, it means that I should send a market order. So this is the interpretation of the graph. Uh, finally, we compare our algorithm with three other ones. So this one is when the learning rate is piecewise constant. This one is when the learning rate is proportional to one over N. And uh, this one is the standard SAG algorithm or uh, an adaptation of the standard SAG algorithm. And we can see that the error in our case converges faster. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Let's see. So finally, I'm going to yes. Can I ask a question about that? So, if I look at the red curve, it rises a bit yes. to the right of 200. It falls again, and then it rises again pretty substantially. Yes, uh, because we have yes. What, what, yes. What's going on there? Is it? This is a very this when we in the the main point. I, I mean, for me, uh, perhaps it's personal, but I'm going to to try to what I understood. So. This is, so when we reach this, we have a variance error. So it's like for, when we reach this point, we have the, the I mean, the idea is to, when we are close to the solution, there is a variance error or imprecision errors that we can uh, get rid of very slowly. So to destroy the error term here, it is very slow and it is possible because of the, it depends mainly on the learning rate and it is possible under this condition what kills the, the error term that we are going to. So it is this condition that kills this very, uh, the, the, this error term that enables to kill this condition. So since we are not, okay, this is condition. And uh, it should, the, the, the gamma square, and uh, yes, it is always, so generally no matter, I, th I think for algorithm, what is interesting is to reach this stationary point where the error starts to fluctuate and uh, then it's it is very it, the, the convergence becomes very slow. Well, so it looks like it's actually diverging, right? No, no, it's not going to diverge. It's uh, if I so, if I moving forward, if 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 I went to six hundred or something, it's going to decrease again. Decay. Yes. Okay. And uh, for oh, for example, uh -huh. if we see, uh, I don't know. Yes, I have. For example, here I have not reached this stage. But when okay. you are going to reach this state, it's going to start fluctuating. Okay, thank you.
Uh, and yes, so I'm going to move to the. Uh, I'm going to move to the to the other example. Yes, so the other example is optimal execution of large number of shares. So what is the problem? So we have an investor. The investor wants to buy quantity Q0 and uh, of a given asset S. So we assume that the assets has the following dynamic. So it has like a trend and this is a uh, variance term or fluctuation error. And so this is the dynamic of the asset. So this represents the dynamic of the assets. And the state of the investor will be represented by two variables, its inventory. So what is its inventory? It's the quantity that he needs to buy between T and the final time capital T. So we have a final time horizon. So what he needs to buy between small T and capital T. So for instance, at the initial time zero, Q0 is simply the quantity, initial quantity that he wants to buy. So Q, capital Q0 is simply Q0. And we have the wealth of the agent. So at each time the agent buys, so here, mu, uh, mu here is like the trading speed. So each time the agent buys instantaneously new delta T, so the quantity for instantaneously is going to buy new delta T, to buy this, he needs to pay new delta T times the price, so the price of the asset ST, and we add uh, a penalization factor. So this is linked to some uh, empirical fact in finance. So, and we add, he's not going to buy it at ST, he's going to buy it at ST plus penalization here, instantaneous penalization. So this is uh, the dynamic of the world, and this is the dynamic of uh, the inventory of the agents. So each time he buys the quantity new delta T, instantaneously he buys the quantity new delta T. And uh, what the agent wants, he wants to monitor the trading speed new in order to, so what he wants in trading speed in order to maximize the following cost function. So there is three components here. The first component is his weight. The second component is what he may win or lose when he liquidates its inventory. So at the end of the period, the agent needs to liquidate its inventory. So the liquidation cost is simply the size of the inventory times the price of the asset. So, and we add, as before, we add uh, penalization term depending on the size of, on, depending on the quantity that you want to buy. If you buy a big quantity, uh, you are going to move the price. So this is empirical fact. So there we have an impact here or penalization term depending on the size of, of the quantity that you want, you want to buy. And finally, there is an inventory cost. So this is an inventory cost. So if the agent has a big inventory, he has to pay more. Why? Because it is uh, additional risk. So for instance, imagine you have an event, a big inventory, the prices moves in the wrong direction. So your loss uh, is going to be big if your in initial inventory, if you, what remaining is to buy is big, if your inventory is big, because the loss is just simply the size of the inventory times the price. So if the price moves in the wrong direction, the loss is going to be bigger if you have huge inventory because it is the inventory times the price more. The loss is the inventory times the price more. And uh, okay, what, so now what we are going to estimate is not the Q function, but it is the value function. It is the same thing as the Q function. We just remove the conditioning with respect to the action. So it is the expected value that you can, that you may win if you start from the initial state, from this following initial state. So we, do not, we don't have a conditioning with respect to the action. So here T is the current time, W is the current wealth, Q is the current inventory, and S is the current uh, price, uh, uh, asset price. So there is a remark. The remark is we can use standard manipulation. Instead of, instead of studying the function capital V, we just can study the function tilde V. And this function tilde V, what is interesting is that it depends on two variables, while this one depends on four variables. So next step is just to approximate tilde V by another approximation tilde VK. 
So this is detailed in the article where the field VK is going to satisfy an equation of the same type that we were studying. So since we have such type of equation, we can estimate VK with our approach. And this is the graph that we obtain. So this is the, it's the same idea. So this is the value function at the t So what we plot here is the function tilde V. It depends on two variables, time and inventory. So here we have two variables, inventory here and time here. So this is theoretical value. We have theoretical value because for this problem, we have closed form formula for Q. We, can, for v. we have almost closed form formula for V. And uh, what this is, th th so this is, these are the uh, algorithms that I described before. So this, the, the learning rate is piecewise constant and this, the learning rate is piecewise constant plus the acceleration of the inner level. And we can see that this one is closer to this one. And finally, yes, to get this result, there is a remark. There is, we need to visit the states. So this is simple remark where the error is large. And finally, I draw, the behavior of the error uh, as a function of uh, for different algorithms uh, when the number of iteration uh, increases and we can see that it is the same algorithm so i'm not i want to describe i'm not going to describe and to describe them again but uh, it behaves better our our behave a little bit better uh, so thank you for attention and sorry for <laughs> it take, took more time than uh, expected and these are the references Okay, well, uh, thank you for a beautiful presentation. And I wonder if there are any more questions from the audience. I have a question. Um, yes. So the, um, um, the, the algorithm is only applicable to um, to reinforcement learning uh, problems, or can it be? Uh, no, no. I think as long I think the idea for no, I don't think so. So it's not only applicable to yes. It it does not depend on reinforcement learning. Why? Because people use the same idea in such type of papers. And the idea is to see the angle. So the main idea, if you want to apply it, is to see the angle between two consecutive errors. If the cosinus is close to one, so cosinus is simply the product scalar, the scalar product divided by the sum by the norm of the errors. If it is close to one, uh, increase the learning rate. Otherwise, try to decrease it. And maybe if they are in positive, and try to decrease it, especially when they are in opposite directions. So if they are in opposite directions, try to decrease. And uh, yes, the idea is simple and you, the idea you can apply it even. Okay. Thank you. So I've got a comment. Um, so I think it's quite ingenious that they're really using to speed up or slow down. And um, I take it you're looking at a, a, a scalar. So when you talk about same sign or opposite sign, that seems to be looking at a scalar um, product, yes. Yeah, so you could potentially extend that to uh, vectors um, and you could look at whether the uh, dot product between the successive vectors is positive or negative. Um, I, I don't know how well that would perform. Um, uh, in particularly, at some cases, you'll see the dot product being close to zero and um, and, yes, but that's but, right. That's but right. If, if it's if it's quite positive or quite negative, I that's think the right. same same argument uh, suggests that the algorithm might work pretty well there also. And yes, so that's right. Suggest you think about it and see if if that's actually right. Yes, thank you. So yes, uh, it, it's a good direction. So I talked about it, but uh, perhaps it it uh, needs to be more like. Uh, it, uh, 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 extended or detailed. So yes, it's. Uh, I think it's a, a good. Uh, it's a good extension. It could be a good extension. So thank you.
Do we have any more questions? Um, I also have a question with respect to the application to uh, optimal execution. Yes. Um, so in that case, you assume that the like that the cost of uh, of trading is linear on the quantity. Yes, exactly. Linear on the quantity. Uh, linear trading cost. Okay. Do you know how if how it behaves in power law uh, or like other um, like other uh, cost market impact function? So the, the idea why it, it may, yes, I mean, the, the, so there is some paper about market impact that shows that if you take, so we, we can, but uh, the idea is when you take, uh, the resolution is simpler. So what we try to do is find simpler, simple example where we can find almost close form formulas and then try if test whether the reinforcement learning algorithm can, can recover or not this closed form formula to check. Mm -hmm. And that's why we tried simple, simple starting exam. Okay. But yes, it's possible. Yeah. And, and it also it can also be applied to uh, pricing American options as well. Uh, yes, I, as long as it is, yes, I, yes, as long as, yes, I think it can be, uh, yes, as long as we have, because uh, mainly uh, control, for, 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 for instance, for standard, yes, American option, what you're trying at each, it, you have a stopping time and each, at each time step, what you can, what you are doing, we're tr you have two decisions, uh, whether you are going to uh, apply your your choice or so if you have a, uh, apply your uh, option or you don't so you have stop in time and you you need at each time step you choose if whether you stop or you don't stop and if you stop i mean it can be and if you stop you have a, uh, you have you can you can estimate your gain and if you don't stop you have an estimation of your gain so in simple cases there is a, it, it uh, becomes uh, like seeing a threshold on the price. You have a threshold on the price. If the price goes beyond the threshold or not being a threshold, we're going to stop or not for American options. But uh, what I want to say is that American options is simply a control problem that, that satisfies also some dynamic programming principle. And as long as it satisfies a dynamic programming principle, you can apply this approach. That's what I, that's the main idea. So yes, I think uh, it is included in this framework, at least if you want discrete time approximation of continuous time, uh, I'm, I'm making an option problem. Okay. Thank you. More questions. It is, yes, it could be. So thank you for the remark because it could be like I can add a new example. Okay, well, let's uh, thank our speaker then. Uh, it's really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope to see a lot more of you at CDAR uh, Seminar. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. Thank Welcome you for the invitation. I hope that I was not boring. No, not boring at all. It's um, just fascinating. And uh, next week, uh, we'll be uh, our speaker will be Aaron Ju from UC Santa Barbara. Between now and then, everyone have a good week and stay safe. And we'll okay. see, you, you. Uh, see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye. Bye.